In the 1960s, all of this was a neighborhood. Houses, families, TV dinners. But it found itself in the way of progress. In this era, neighborhoods around the world were raised and replaced, sometimes with housing projects, sometimes with transportation projects, and in this case, a parking lot and a small skyscraper. It's now being redeveloped back into the mixed use and residential that it used to be, because you know, just like all progress, we often take it a little bit too far and make a mistake that then has to be cleaned up. Urban planning botched a lot around this time. It was when cars existed, but their consequences weren't really understood. Human beings were going to be on the moon, not biking to pick up their organic vegetable baskets. Space potato. Man needed highways, a backyard for spanking children, and his wife. Ha ha! Medium density inner city neighborhoods are dirty hives of scum and villainy. They must be demolished. But like a lot of bold ideas, eventually the pendulum reached its zenith and swung back the other direction. People became mad as hell and decided that they weren't going to take it anymore. Residents realized they didn't have to go along with this stuff. They could march down the street and get the neighbors involved and vote those motherfuckers out of office. You see, decisions on zoning and specific construction projects are usually locally controlled. In a particular city, ward, or borough, there might only be 50,000 votes cast to decide who makes decisions like Demolish those buildings that are there for the future. Well, people realized they could take the votes of those highly motivated residents and instead demolish the future career of any politician that stood in their way. And oh boy, did they. The method spread quickly across the world's democracies. Tell them how to bring those sons of bitches down. No to highway projects. No to the coal power plants in our backyard. And nuclear, did you see Three Mile Island? And while we're talking about our community, we need those parking spaces to take our kids to school. And no to these massive housing projects. They're just poverty traps and create criminals and so much noise. And you know about noise pollution, right? Because it gives me very vaguely defined forms of fatigue. And so no to that fucking wind turbine that I can see out my window. And speaking of that window, I need it. I need it. No tall buildings there, because blocking the sun decreases my quality of life and the children can be seen playing creepy doctor by everyone in that new condo. The pendulum swung back hard. We are a long way from reasonable compromise at this point. We are in this fucking sucks territory. Now this swing has brought good things. You as a citizen now have your local government respecting you. You have the ability to tune them up. We get a lot less top-down government dictating how things are going to be done these days. They'll consult you over the opening of a box of poutine. But this empowered populace has come at a cost, and our democratic process has basically malfunctioned and needs repair. Because we can no longer build enough houses for people to live in. You can build more housing by expanding into places where no one lives, which is what many cities have done, but expanding into endless suburbia I mean, every microphone juggling lispy Canadian couple on the internet will tell you what's wrong with that. Like and subscribe. So instead of expanding, we're trying a different approach. Densification. But we cannot just, thanks to citizen pushback, build the number of houses we need. We never get ahead of demand and get a decent stockpile of vacant housing built. Look at Nicolas Cage. Look at him! See this $90,000 watch? The reason this Rolex is valuable isn't because it cost $90,000 to make, it's because from a hundred years of history, we know that Rolex will never flood the market. They constrain supply and work to keep them a premium product. You can invest your money in it and know that you'll always be as special as Nicolas Cage. I'm a little tired, I'm a little wired. Housing, because it's been so scarce for so long, isn't just the great store of wealth that it's always been, it's become a great investment too. Investing in housing is essentially a bet against our societies solving this shortage. The investors are a symptom, not the cause of a problem. When there was a rush on toilet paper during the pandemic, reality caught up with those asswipe investors, but there is no reality to catch up with buyers of residential property. The reality is the endless shortage. The housing mills never spun up to make 50 million more rolls of residential real estate. We've seen more interest from private equity going into these supply constrained markets with very strong demand, because they really see this as a protected market. There's not a lot of competition among landlords, which make this a great place to own property. Investors know that we can't get enough materials, skilled tradespeople, and most importantly, space to construct the housing needed. Oh, a housing market where people are sleeping in their cars? Oh, great, I love desperate inelastic demand. Yep, we've been so consistently bad at building housing 
for so long that our desperate requirement for it has made it into a reliable investment. Flipping property is such a normal career that where I live, producing TV shows about flipping property is a normal career. The kitchen is where you want to invest your money. That's where you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck. At City Hall, in academia, everyone knows the primary issue is supply. But the people in power are paralyzed. Homeowners vote at much higher rates than renters. Renters don't often see a vacant lot on their street and think, oh, that will be my first home in five years, so I guess I should go down to the public meeting and defend my future home's right to exist by defending some rich property developer that I don't know. Compounding this, existing owners benefit in aggregate from having less housing built. I mean, look at the house prices in Vancouver, a city that has managed to spend decades with a vacancy rate hovering around crisis levels of 1%. It worked out pretty well for some hippie who bought a bungalow in the 1980s. They're a millionaire now, just from being in the right place at the right time. And in a blast from the past, when places are redeveloped, it's usually lower income areas because renters are also poorer and the group of voters that you're most likely to be able to sneak one by on. Instead of facing our failure head on, we've taken a leaf out of the 2016 Democratic Party playbook and blamed the Russians for our problems. Our hottest housing markets in terms of prices since 2015 are like London and Woodstock and Tilsonburg. And we don't have Russian oligarchs buying up Tilsonburg. <laughs> we always do love blaming not us for our problems. We blame Airbnb, tourists, we blame foreign buyers, the Chinese. We set up rent control, save us rent control. We set up vacancy registries, rent registries, tax vacant properties. Every single policy has been implemented and it hasn't worked. It just hasn't worked. <laughs> At best, it just slows down this march. My favorite thing that represents this category of time-wasting policy is the adventures of Mr. Counts Windows at Nightman. Mr. Counts Windows at Nightman doesn't need statistics or reports from the government or any data because he is the world's preeminent expert on how many windows should be illuminated in some condo tower that he saw at 11 p.m. one evening. Based on these windows in this location, I think that we're dealing with uh, dirty money and uh, property developers and foreigners. Yeah, yeah, I like the sound of that. Off to Facebook to let people know. When something gets enacted to appease these anecdotes and prices just keep marching higher, we tend to simply move on to the next feel-good idea. Before implementing its vacant house tax, Vancouver estimated there were more than 10,000 empty homes. But after implementation, it turned out it only applied to 2,538 units. In 2019, that dropped to 1,893 units. So we got 645 units out of the hands of those mysterious rich foreign investors, those genius investors who like to buy assets that they then lose money on because they're not leased out. To put that in perspective, the city of Vancouver is currently building around 7,000 units a year. So all of that energy and discussion and work to give Vancouver what it builds in one month of a single year. Or take Airbnb, which had around 10,000 listings in my city before the bad thing. Well, that's about how many houses we build a year. So basically, okay, let's ban Airbnb. Great, we did it. Okay, now what next year? And the year after that, and the year after that, and the year after that. These drops in a bucket just consume so much of the public discourse for how measly the effects will be. Some places have literally started to run out of ideas for how to not face economic reality. And we do know in Vancouver and in British Columbia, they've kind of thrown everything in the kitchen sink when it comes to these sort of policy prescriptions. So, you know, they've, they've got uh, vacant home taxes at multiple levels, both the provincial and municipal level. Uh, they've got uh, foreign buyer taxes and so on. They've done all of these things and they've had some marginal impact. They seem to have lowered price growth a little bit for those one bedroom condos, but it really hasn't changed much when it comes to family homes. For people my age who've lived in reasonably nice cities their whole lives, a surplus supply of housing is hard to imagine. But supply and demand does still apply to housing, and one recent example uh, certainly proves this. In New York, at the start of the pandemic, people left the city and their leases in droves because a $3,000 shoebox in the city that never sleeps when it's on bed rest <laughs> made no sense when you can work from anywhere. Rents almost immediately started dropping. And of course, those people had to go somewhere and they headed to the suburbs where they ate up all available supply and caused record increases in house prices. Oh my God, what a surprise. Population declines impacted my city in the 90s. 
The silver lining of population decline, where you're reducing demand, is those cheap, cheap houses. But, of course, there is a way to solve this housing equation that's less of a downer than economic depression. In one country that I know well, it's kind of my shtick, the situation has gotten so patently obvious that they are actually finally having to do something. Something that will work. New Zealand closed its borders hard during the pandemic. The North Korea of the South Pacific. It then experienced, like many countries, a massive escalation in housing prices, but with no foreigners or immigrants to blame. The government knows its supply. Their reports are packed with lines like, Previous large increases in housing supply in New Zealand, such as during the 1970s, have reduced real house prices. In recent decades, several other countries have experienced declining house prices following significant increases in supply. And from the Treasury, Supply of new houses is currently limited by regulatory infrastructure. Measures aimed at boosting housing supply seem to us a preferred way forward. And then they did what most countries are probably going to do because it's what actually works. And I have never seen so many nerdy people's eyes light up in excitement over a piece of policy before. They used the magic of proportional representation, got it in, to pass laws agreed on by both the government and the opposition. Right to build. This means that developers have a right to build three-story medium density housing in big cities without the typical barriers and consent requirements. They also passed laws removing height limits under six stories and car parking requirements nationwide. They're taking the ability to oppose housing developments out of the hands of local government. Because at this point, we can look around all the countries in the world and see that this is just a universal flaw in local government. Local governments selected by local residents are unable to operate in a rational way for the good of their society when it comes to densifying housing. Locals can oppose highways and bike lanes and skateboarding kids, but there's really no good reason to oppose housing when we need housing. It's a house and we need a lot of them, now more than ever. It's almost a gift to municipal politicians. The ability to say no and not lose their job. Yes! Oh, that new condo on your suburban street? I'm sorry, I, I can't help. I wish I could, but the higher up government has overruled us on this one, sorry. What a policy like this also does is it spreads the burden of building housing across the entire country and all the neighborhoods in the cities. Rural voters living outside of the city don't give a shit about some four-story building on your street that you think ruins neighborhood character. And when the suburbs, rural towns and cities all take their share of a burden, instead of just the occasional car park downtown or transit corridor, the overall level of development isn't as hard to bear. The overall effect after a decade will be housing not being an incredibly stressful thing for your society and denser and stronger towns, TM. Something wonderful about mature democracies is that they do value their citizens. That inflow of new people that come into our countries is part of why our houses are an investment grade asset. And they're coming here because it's a nice place to live. But we've been snagged on a floor in our democratic process. And it's crazy how much damage it's done to our societies. Lots of great things come from local citizen empowerment. It's just we can't give them all of the empowerment. Because you know, just like all progress, we often take it a little bit too far and make a mistake that then has to be cleaned up. We can't get enough materials, skilled tradespeople, and most importantly, space to construct that. <laughs> My fucking hand isn't dexterous enough to do that motion. Okay. I don't have enough dexterity in my hand to do one, two, three. It's one, two, five. One, two, and another one over here. Then if I do this one first, I'm flipping them off, and this is also. Several other countries have experienced declining housing supplies as well. <laughs> do I sound, I don't sound like a New Zealander, right? Yeah. Such as during the 1970s have reduced real house prices in recent decades. Do I sound a little bit more like a New Zealander now? Okay. Something wonderful about mature democracies is that they do value their citizen. <laughs> it's like, it's filmed by a construction site. That's the point.